to begin this session um, hosted by the Journal of Physiology. Um, we have three speakers today. Um, here we've got Kim, Vatsala and Rishi and we'll be going through some of the fundamentals of journal, what makes a good journal, how to plan your study and how to write up your the best manuscript possible and Kim will also go over some ethical pitfalls that you will need to avoid. Vatsala will then talk about the um, Journal of Physiology's peer review process, what she looks at as an editor, um, and also some specifics around Journal of Physiology's scope and the article types that she accepts. Rishi will then talk about um, his experience as being a Journal of Physiology referee, um, looking at some reasons why manuscripts may be rejected, and also he may talk about some of his experiences as publishing with us as an author, and some of the reasons why you might like to pick the Journal of Physiology as your home for your best research. So I'll hand over to Kim shortly, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, on your screen, you should see um, an Ask a Question um, <clears throat> box. Um, you can click on this and ask a question throughout the meeting. We'll have um, some time for Q&A at the end. Um, if you have a question for one of the speakers in particular, please just say, this question is for Kim, this question is for Vatsala or Rishi, and then we will direct the questions to them at the end. If it's for no particular person, then just, we don't need to mention the name, and I'll moderate the questions at the end. So please do feel free to ask any questions you like, and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. So I'd like to hand it over to Kim. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, I guess. Uh, it's morning here in the United States. I'm just going to try sharing my screen. So um, hopefully everybody can see my slides. Um, uh, it's an honor to have this opportunity to speak to you this, this afternoon about um, publishing for beginners and how to effectively present your work for publication. So here are some tips for writing a great manuscript, and we're going to go into these in more detail. Um, where do you start? Uh, um, of course, before you even begin to write, it's all about planning your study. And to do that, you need to keep publication in mind when you're designing your work. You need to decide who the authors will be, uh, do a thorough literature search so that you can place your work in context. Write up your methods as you finish the experiments and start writing up the results early as well to see uh, where you might have uh, missing data or gaps in your story that need to be filled. Get as much input from colleagues as possible and know the journal that you're submitting to. Um, it's very important that before you even start writing, you look at the instructions for authors and that you check that you meet the journal criteria. So the big question that everybody asks, of course, is how do I get my work published in a good journal? And the answer to that, of course, is to do a good study. Think about what you'll need for a good publication when formulating your question and your hypotheses and when designing your experiment. A few words about authorship, because this is obviously the coin of the realm for any scientist, and it's appropriate that you get credit for the work that you've done. Um, authorship can sometimes be a difficult uh, topic to address, particularly for junior investigators, but it's good to get in the habit of having discussions about who will be the authors on a paper and the order in which they will appear as early as possible, uh, preferably before even starting the project. You may need to make changes along the way as additional experiments, uh, as the, the data point to additional experiments, but at least have an idea of who's going to be uh, in the authorship list. Um, authors should include only those who've made a substantive intellectual contribution to the project and are in a position to defend the data and the conclusions publicly. Um, there are a number of uh, schemes for criteria for authorships and, and all good journals will have some guidelines on this. In the biomedical area, most uh, journals conform to what are called the ICMJE criteria, which stands for the International Council on Medical Journal Editors, and you can see the link there. And these criteria call for authors to have had substantial contributions either to the conception or design of the work 
or the acquisition analysis or interpretation of the data for the work, and um, they need to have been involved in drafting the work or revising it critically for intellectual content. So um, somebody who just, um, you know, uh, beautifies the figures or edits uh, the language of the manuscript is usually not considered to be an author. It really has to be an intellectual contribution. And all authors must approve the manuscript prior to submission. That's very important to consider. Um, so authorship is not only uh, a benefit, but it's also a responsibility. So you don't want to allow your name to be put on a manuscript where you've not fulfilled the uh, criteria for authorship. Similarly, you should not be included on a manuscript where you haven't had a chance personally to review the data on which the manuscript is based, because you are responsible for defending the data and conclusions as one of the authors. So what are the essential elements of a manuscript? You've all read papers, and so you know that most biomedical articles have this, this four-part structure, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. So these sections of the manuscript have very important roles, and it's important to put the right material in the right place. So for example, the introduction provides the context and the rationale based on what was known and what was unknown, why did you do the study? The methods tell the readers how you did the study, the results tell the readers what you found, and the discussion is about what your results mean in the context of the existing body of knowledge. So when you're first starting out authoring manuscripts, you might think that uh, this order of uh, the manuscript, the way the manuscript is presented to the reader is the same way that you would write it. But I would like to make the argument that this is not a good order to write the manuscript in, even though that's a good order to read it in, um, because there are some parts that are more straightforward to prepare than others. And if you're a beginning author, it's great to start with the easiest parts. So my suggestion is that the first part of the manuscript that you would write would be the methods. And as I indicated earlier, you can start this as you're doing the experiments. Methods should be written in the past tense. You're telling the reader of something that you did in the past. You want to check on whether the journal has any particular format. Some journals have very significant limitations for the number of characters in the manuscript overall or in the methods section. And so for these particular journals, you may need to put some of the methods in supplemental material. I'll say parenthetically that for the Journal of Physiology, we have no page limits, no character limits. And so we like to see a complete description of the methods in the manuscript itself. You want to describe your study design and the reasons that you selected the methods that you used precisely identify the models and the reagents that you used um, and indicate appropriate approvals for animal or human studies, which is obviously particularly important for physio physiological work. And the bottom line for the methods section is that you should include enough detail so others can repeat the work. But it's not a, a sort of verbatim copy of your lab book with step-by-step -step protocols. Having written the methods, you're in a good position then to move on to the results. And obviously this is the heart of your manuscript. This is, a, this is the original content. You want to use a logical order. You don't need to follow the chronology of the study as it was performed, because sometimes when you're doing experiments, you think of something that you should have maybe done at the beginning. You double back, you uh, uh, run a particular control or so forth. But when you write it up, you want it to be in a logical order. You want to report only the results that are relevant to your hypothesis. And for those of you who are still postgraduate students, um, you're not writing up your thesis where you probably want to have a complete record of everything that you did. Um, but um, on the other hand, you should not omit data just because they don't support your hypothesis. And the results is not the place for lengthy analysis of the data or comparisons of the data with others in the literature, but you do need to provide enough interpretation to lead the re reader from one experiment to the next. So for example, 
you know, we found that X cause Y. And so our next step was to look to see how Y was related to uh, Z. And the uh, overarching uh, goal in the results section is to tell a story. And sometimes it's very helpful to gather the figures that you think will tell the story and lay them out on a table and see what makes the best sense in terms of the order that you present the information. Having written the results, then you can move on to writing the, the discussion. And in the discussion section, it's important that you are very explicit about the answer to the question that you posed in the study. And I would put this right up front, um, whether your study was phrased as a question or a hypothesis, tell the reader what you found right away at the beginning of the discussion. Follow up with supporting evidence, explain uh, your answer. Um, Definitely, I suggest that you discuss the most important conclusions first. And typically, the discussion section is written in the present tense because you're talking about how you feel about the data right here, right now. And only when you've completed the methods, results, and discussion should you move on to writing the introduction. The introduction has two purposes. It's to get the reader interested in the topic so that hopefully they'll read further and prepare the reader to understand the paper in its context. Um, the biggest issue I see with people writing introductions when they're starting out is they write too much. You want to keep the introduction short, just information that is pertinent to this study, um, a brief review of the pertinent literature, but you are not writing a review article of everything that you know on the topic. So stay focused, and that's why uh, I recommend that you write the introduction last, so then you're not just going to sit down with a blank piece of paper. You've got a great idea of the sto story that you want to tell. Be very explicit about your hypothesis or your research question, so people uh, will have a sense as they look at your results what your study was designed to address. And this is uh, this last point on the slide is. Um, a matter of some controversy. Uh, some people feel that it's good to end the introduction with a paragraph that briefly summarizes the findings. Personally, I don't like to see that. You know, the introduction is not um, a place for results. It is the introduction. Um, so you'll find that p different people have different opinions. So it's really a case of when you're a, a trainee uh, conforming to your uh, mentor's style, but when you are running your own independent research program, you get to choose how to address this. So what are some tips for success? As I've already mentioned, think about what you will need for a good publication when formula formulating your experimental question and your hypotheses and when designing the experiment. It's really important to read the instructions. Um, a lot of journals now allow you to submit your manuscript in any format, but you still need to comply with the journal's policies. And, and if, if you have submitted in a format that's not consistent with the journal, at some point, if you're asked to revise your manuscript, you will be, able to, you will be asked to put it in the right format for that journal. And my own uh, personal preference as a best practice is just put it in the journal's format to begin with. That way it doesn't send the um, implicit message to the reviewers that you actually intended this from a, for another journal in the first place, or perhaps even have had the paper rejected from another journal. You want to avoid carelessness, spelling, grammar, um, mistakes in formatting. Um, it, these are not sort of necessarily detrimental to the scientific message in and of themselves, but if the um, manuscript is careless, it may cause reviewers to ask the question of whether you were careless with the experiments as well. Make sure your references are appropriate and also accurate. Um, make sure people's names are spelled correctly. Remember who your reviewers might be. Um, when an editor doesn't know who to assign the manuscript to as a reviewer, they'll often look at your references and draw potential reviewers from there. Um, make sure that the file format is appropriate, including the figures, and always take the opportunity to check the manuscript at the end of the online submission process to make sure that the 
The version that actually appears online is the one that you want the reviewers to see. And then finally, make sure that the journal has actually received your manuscript, that you have clicked all the buttons that are needed to actually submit it. Um, and uh, typically, you will receive an email confirmation that your manuscript has been received. If you don't get that email, you need to check with the journal to make sure that they actually got it. Which journal? Your research will find a home eventually. There is a, a, a place for every work pretty much to be published. Um, but how do you choose the journal that you're going to target initially? Um, first of all, you want to think about the target audience. Who would be interested in reading this paper? The first audience of readers that you have to convince are the editor and the reviewers, but you always want to keep this in mind. So think about whether your um, paper is a very broad interest or um, might be more appropriately targeted to a, a specialized journal. Um, it's also uh, critical to get a sense of the overarching importance and significance of your findings. Of course, this is your baby. This is a project that you've worked on sometimes for um, you know, more than a year or two. And yet, um, it's very difficult when you're in the midst of the project to really um, see it uh, um, with an unbiased eye. So it's good to get input from colleagues in terms of how um, you may consider the manuscript. You want to have an idea of the journal you want to submit to when you're planning the study because the direction that you go um, uh, is important and also how you write up the work. So know what journals published. Uh, are they looking for mechanistic studies, applied studies? Is it physiology versus pathophysiology? And know what they expect in terms of the scope of a given paper. And it, you can get a really good sense of this by reading issues of the journal. Again, check that you comply with journal policies. The Journal of Physiology recently um, uh, revised its statistical policies and also its policies with respect to presenting data. And um, so we are seeing a lot of authors who are um, you know, getting up to speed with how to present their data appropriately so that they conform with our policy. And then what about the publishing model? I'll have a little more to say about this in another slide or two, but um, does the journal support um, the requirements of whoever funded your work for accessibility to the work? And do you have the funds available to support any publication fees if that's needed? If you are in doubt about any of these issues, you can always ask the editor. Uh, at J Journal of Physiology, we welcome pre-submissions inquiries. Uh, most good journals will have policies on uh, uh, all sorts of aspects of publication, including animal and human experiment statistics and the others listed here. And so you should check that you comply with these policies prior to submission. If you don't, you run the risk of having your manuscript just uh, returned to you immediately because it's not in compliance. Um, and we published uh, some time ago some principles and standards for reporting animal experiments in our journals. And um, particularly in the physiological realm, uh, many journals will have an editor, as we do, responsible for checking the animal ethics. Types of journals. So um, again, check whether the uh, body that funded your work has any specific requirements for how you must publish it. Um, there are basically three types of journal, uh, subscription journals, um, which uh, the costs of publishing are supported by the subscribers to the journal, although even these may have either submission fees or publication fees, sometimes referred to as page charges. Um, as you'll hear, Journal of Physiology doesn't have e either of those. Um, Open access journals, in these journals, all accepted articles must pay the article processing charge. So here, rather than the subscribers covering the cost of publication, it's the authors themselves. However, not all open access journals are created equal. Um, there are so-called predatory open access journals, which will take your manuscript, but um, not give you a good service and not give your work the visibility that you desire. Um, and so just be careful that you uh, don't get trapped. Um, 
often your librarians will have a good sense of which are the legitimate journals and which are predatory. And many of the legitimate open access journals like um, Physiological Reports, which is jointly published by the Physiological Society and the American Physiological Society are published by societies. Um, hybrid journals. So these are uh, journals that are subscription journals, but may have an open access option available, although it's not mandatory for authors to use that. So the Journal of Physiology is indeed a hybrid journal. If uh, authors wish to publish open access, they can do so for a charge of uh, 4,700 US dollars, but otherwise, as I've already alluded to, is free to publish in the Journal of Physiology. Um, one of the ways you can choose the journal to uh, submit to is getting a sense of journal metrics. Um, and one I'm sure that many, if not all of you have heard of is the journal impact factor, which is a measure of the frequency with which an average article has been cited. Um, it was never intended for a way to uh, authors to choose the journals to submit to. It was designed as a tool for librarians to identify the journals that they would buy. Um, it doesn't give you any information about the quality of a specific article in the journal. It's an aggregate measure. Also, we know that citation distributions are highly skewed with um, only very few journals having high numbers of uh, few papers having high numbers of citations, um, but many having uh, few or none. Um, it's also very much dependent on the field, the size of the field, and also the type of the journal. Journals that publish uh, only or a lot of review articles will get a lot more citations. And there's also various games that editors can play if they're unscrupulous to manipulate the impact factor. And it's a commercial product, and so the data that are used to calculate impact factor are not readily available. Um, also mentioned on this slide is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, <coughs> where publishers and journals agreed to move away from uh, reliance or over-reliance on impact factor. So what else can you do? You can look at other citation metrics, such as the total citations of a journal, um, the cited half-life, how long, what's the longevity of a typical article? Um, there are other um, indices such as eigenfactor, article, article influence score, immediacy index, how quickly are articles cited, and the distribution of citations in a journal. Um, and there are other sort of non-typical ways of looking at the impact of a journal uh, that are listed here, such as uh, altmetrics, which look at uh, um, the influence of an article across a variety of spheres, including um, mentions in the press and social media. Um, you can look at just the overall number of downloads of a given article, because that presumably means that people are reading it, even if they're not citing it. The editorial statistics, which I think Vatsala will address, are also an important measure for a journal. And what does the journal do to make sure that your work is visible? Do they promote it on social media, press releases? Do they talk about it in blogs? Um, uh, is it mentioned in newsletters or does the journal have a newsletter? And are there articles that are highlighted by the editor? So I'm going to wrap up a little bit by talking quickly about ethical issues, which are increasing in the scientific literature. Um, most journals, including Journal of Physiology, um, take ethical math matters very seriously. And um, so they may screen for figure manipulation or plagiarism. Um, there can be sanctions applied if you are um, uh, um, seen to have uh, um, violated these pub policies and could potentially be a career breaker. And there's a lot of information about publications ethics on a site called uh, COPE, the Committee on Publications Ethics, shown here. So there may be data fabrication or falsification, which increasingly includes inappropriate and possibly innocent manipulation of figures. Plagiarism, we screen all papers for plagiarism upon submission. Duplicate publication, where the same paper is attempted to be published in more than one place. Redundant publication, which is also quite common. This is usually innocent copy and paste. 
but you really should not be using text or data even from your own papers in a new paper. Um, this is also referred to as auto or self-plagiarism, and then other things can happen along the way. So data fabrication falsification uh, involves changing or making up data in a manuscript that is intended to improve the results and include, includes digital manipulation. You want to present the exact results obtained. Don't withhold data that don't fit your hypothesis and don't try to beautify your images. You should not move, remove, introduce, obscure, or enhance any specific feature within an image. So I've just got a couple of examples of this. Uh, this was a figure submitted actually to one of the uh, American Physiological Society's journals. And actually it was a revision. The authors were asked to provide an image where they had more cells. And this is the figure that the author submitted. But in fact, it was comprised of several panels pasted together to make it look like that there were more cells in the image than actually that there were. Here's an example of improper adjustment. Um, where the original gel is shown on the left and the uh, gel that was actually presented in the, fig in the manuscript is on the right, number uh, four in the example. So the contrast has been changed so excessively that it looks like this lane only contains a single band, whereas in fact, as you can see from image number one, there were several in the first, um, uh, first lane of this gel. And then here's a particularly egregious example. This was an a image of a Western blot that was submitted to an APS journal. And when the authors were asked to provide the original gels, these are the gels that they said uh, generated uh, this figure. So you can see that this is uh, not at all representative of the raw data. So I just want to end by talking about our efforts to engage early career researchers. Um, we have a journal club feature, which is often a great way for people to get involved initially with the journal. You can either write up a piece on uh, a recent article in the journal, or we also now have an online uh, oral uh, journal club that early career researchers can moderate. Uh, we have an editorial board fellowship, which I'll talk about in more detail. Uh, we uh, uh, frequently publish editorials. We do webinars like this. We have uh, really comprehensive author instructions. We have staff on hand to help. We uh, give prizes to early career investigators. We um, definitely welcome pre-submission inquiries. And we publish in uh, our original articles a short biography of the first author to really help people get some uh, uh, exposure in the community. And um, the slide also shows a, an editorial that I wrote talking about uh, the things that we do for early career researchers. Um, the Editorial Board Fellowship is an opportunity for early career researchers, typically in their first permanent position, to um, get involved with the journal as an editor, uh, making editorial decisions. So it's a professional development opportunity. It allows us to address the geographical balance of our board. Um, we can develop potential new editors, and then we get perspectives from early career researchers on how to further develop the journal at our uh, board meetings. Um, for this fellowship, you need to have a postgraduate qualifications, be within five years of your first academic appointment, be a lead author on at least one paper in a, in a highly respected international journal, have some experience of peer review, um, maybe have some uh, direct connection with the journal, have served as a referee for other leading journals. Um, there's a, a letter of support that's required for finalists and individuals for this program should not have had experience in making editorial decisions. So um, we have been running this scheme now for four years. It's been very popular and you can see the submission numbers on the left-hand side. And four fellows from the original cohort last year were appointed as reviewing editors for the journal. And they wrote a really nice editorial um, that I refer you to. So that's it from me. And uh, hopefully now we can pass this over to Vatsala. Thank you, Kim. That was really nice. Uh, thank you to all the audience for um, coming here. 
and um, also thanks to Sally, who's going to be sharing my presentation. Uh, so Sally, if um, we can have the slide, the first slide. So my job today is to tell you a little bit more about the Journal of Physiology. I uh, joined the editorial board of Journal of Physiology as a reviewing editor in uh, 2019. And uh, I've had a really fun experience, um, you know, handling several interesting manuscripts uh, in, in uh, neurobiology. There we go. Um, sorry for the hiccup there. Um, so yeah, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit of history about the journal. Uh, journal of Physiology is actually a 150 year old journal, nearly 150 year old journal. Rishi, can you go to the next slide? Um, so it was established in 1878 and uh, it was bought by the Physiological Society uh, in 1925. And currently it's published by Wiley Blackwell on behalf of the Physiological Society. So it's a society run journal run by scientists. Um, and so you can, uh, you know, the peer review is really a rigorous process run by career scientists drawn from all over the world. The editorial board itself uh, comprises of scientists from everywhere in the world. All continents are represented um, and physiologists in all uh, areas are included in the editorial board. And um, really, especially for neurobiologists, you know, you cannot imagine training as a neurobiologist without reading some of the classical studies that were reported in the Journal of Physiology, such as you know, Hodgkin and Huxley's papers on the electrical ner nature of uh, nerve impulses or Hubel, Hubel and Wiesel's classical studies of receptive fields in the lateral geniculate nucleus or the visual cortex. And then their later experiments on nature versus nurture, you know, monocular deprivation and how that affects cortical columns. All of those things, you know, and quantal synaptic transmission, of course, the mechanism of vesicle release and quanta and all of those fantastic studies that came out in the last century were reported in Journal of Physiology. And in that sense, you know, this journal continues to be at the forefront for reporting the major physiological findings. Uh, Rishi, the next slide, please. So just to give you some uh, brief metrics about the journal, uh, for reasons that Kim explained, I'm not going to place much uh, importance to the impact factor from an author's point of view. But what is uh, really striking is that the journal ranks first amongst the total number of uh, citations received in physiology, right? Um, and that means that your fellow physiologists are reading papers that appear in Journal of, Neuro journal of Physiology and they are citing them. So if you uh, have your paper here it's most likely to be seen by the audience that uh, you want it you want to share it with right and um, so so the um, for the field if you're thinking about you know where in the field do I want to place my paper this is probably a good home uh, for your manuscript next slide Rishi so um, next, we come to the Journal of Physiology's uh, scope. Um, so it publishes studies in all fields of physiology, ranging from not just neurobiology, though I happen to be a neurobiologist, um, uh, you know, everything ranging from alimentary, gastrointestinal, uh, intro, cardiovascular, computational studies, uh, endocrine, exercise physiology, molecular and cellular physiology, muscle physiology, uh, neuroscience, of course, and, uh, you know, uh, reproductive and renal and respiratory, all of those aspects of physiology are covered by the journal. And if you just open the website, you'll see the papers that are uh, published in each of these sub uh, headings in the uh, listing of the table of contents. Next slide, uh, Rishi. So, yes, uh, all areas of physiology and pathophysiology, of course, are covered by the journal. Um, the main requirements are that the manuscript has a significant advance over what is already known in the field. 
Um, so it must illustrate new physiological principles or mechanisms, be uh, a step above what, um, what has been established already. Uh, theoretical papers are uh, welcome. And you know your level of analysis need not be at any one particular level. It can be molecular, cellular, at the tissue level, organ level, or systems level. Um, and we are particularly keen on research with a clinical or translational focus. Um, and the journal publishes work not only on uh, model systems uh, that are mammalian, but also using other uh, lower vertebrate and invertebrate models, uh, because we appreciate that you know the findings that come out of studying these multiple model organisms ultimately throw light on how the biology functions. And uh, therefore, if your paper has a broad message for the mechanism or for a particular phenomenon that applies uh, even outside of the model organism that you're studying as a general principle, um, then you know it, it could uh, potentially be considered at the journal. Next slide, please. So there are um, several different uh, article types, one of which uh, Kim already spoke about, the journal club, uh, which is for early career review, uh, researchers. Um, you can uh, choose a paper that appeared in the last three months or so. Um, and if you want to write either based on your lab meeting discussion, which several people are doing these days, you know, discuss a paper at lab meeting and when questions come up or when points for interpretation are raised, uh, then they write it up and this can be a journal club type article. But uh, typically before you do this, you should check with the peer review team at the journal because um, we don't uh, you know, want multiple people writing journal clubs on the same paper. So we want to make sure that you know, uh, the paper that you want to write about is not already being considered for journal club from other sets of authors. So it's better to check with the um, peer review group at the uh, journal and instructions are available on the website. Um, the main article type is, of course, the full length research article, which again, Kim spoke at length about, you know, the various parts of this research article, introduction, methods, results, discussion, and so on and so forth. Um, but also techniques are another class of articles that are considered as long as the technique that you report is new and useful for studying physiology, some aspect of physiology that is being enlightened by this novel technique. Um, other classes are letters and replies. Uh, in case you have an, a comment on a recent publication, you differ from the authors in terms of interpretation. Then uh, such letters, if they are valid, criticisms of the uh, published work can be considered and replies from the author, uh, original authors are sought and the letter and the reply are published. Uh, the perspectives are, uh, you know, uh, invited by the editorial board on research articles that have been accepted, uh, especially for findings that are, um, you know, uh, very exciting for the field, bring new perspective for the field. Uh, then you know, the editorial board invites the uh, scientists who are likely to have a close association. Sorry, we lost the screen. Um, Rishi? He maybe lost his connection by the looks of it. Uh oh. OK, I'll continue talking. That's fine. So um, Perspectives are like your um, uh, news and views, you know, um, it places the paper in context. What is new about this paper? Why should you uh, pay attention to this paper? What are the key findings and why are they interesting? Um, and a related type is also the translational perspectives, which talks about um, what is the implication for a more translational application of this particular paper that was accepted for publication. And usually the perspectives and the research article on which the perspectives was written are uh, both published at the same time in the journal in the same issue. Um, other formats include invited topical reviews which may be standalone reviews in on a uh, particular subject, one uh, particular topic, or it could be a special collection, you know, a collection of reviews on 
um, of a particular subfield. Um, and these are also typically invited or commissioned. Um, but if you have an idea, you, you can write to the editorial board or the uh, peer review team and ask if this can be considered. Uh, all right. Um, the one exciting type of article that I want to talk about that's special for Journal of Physiology are the crosstalk debates. These are, again, uh, topics or controversies in fields where the, edit, uh, the uh, editorial board considers topics that are considered to be controversial or that there are evidences that are present on both sides and therefore you know people watching the debate are not clear exactly what the evidence is for one side of the argument against the other in such cases what um, happens is that a crosstalk debate is initiated where two sets of people who are invited again because of their history of publishing in this particular subfield um, are asked to provide their view in the debate. So one recent example was about um, the lactate shuttle between astrocytes and neurons uh, and how neurons utilize energy. This is a very, very interesting set of uh, crosstalk debate articles that's appeared in uh, the Journal of Physiology. I encourage you to go and look it up. Um, but the idea behind the crosstalk debates is that if you are new to a field, you quickly get up to date with um, all of the literature that is um, um, pertinent to the topic that you're trying to research. And because it's a debate, you get both sides of the argument, both sides of the debate. It's not if, if it's a review written by one person alone or one group of individuals, more likely than not, you'll get only one side of the story. Whereas with the crosstalk debates, you're more likely to get a more rounded opinion of uh, what the entire field thinks about it. So these are really exciting um, uh, article types in the Journal of Physiology. And as early career reviewers are, sorry, early career researchers, um, I think it's very important for you to go through some of these um, some of these articles, crosstalk debate uh, topics, to see if there is a debate that is relevant to your research area, and if yes, then you should definitely go read it up uh, to see what um, what is the current status of a particular research question. Okay, okay, so that was uh, the crosstalk uh, debate. And the other types are, of course, you know, prize lectures and symposium reports, which are also all um, invited or commissioned. OK, I think Rishi is having a little bit of trouble with the with the presentation, but that doesn't matter. I think. Uh, yeah, there we are. Are you able to go to the next slide, Rishi? Yeah, so having uh, spoken about the journal itself, now I'll talk about the review process at the Journal of Physiology since I've been there about two years now and have handled the manuscript. So I'll generally walk you through the different stages of review. Let's start with what exactly is peer review and why is it important? Um, peer stands for someone who is your equal, more likely, um, your uh, colleague in the field, who's going to give his or her opinion on the body of work. And it's important because it sort of provides a stamp of validation. And in general, you know, the peer review process ends up making the manuscript more uh, readable, more valid, um, and ensures that there are quality control steps in every, every step. Um, and that generally improves the scientific validity of the uh, study under question. So the uh, peer review is a process of screening a submitted manuscript to make calls on whether that manuscript is a significant advance over the existing knowledge, uh, whether the methods used are valid and of uh, uh, high quality, um, and whether the um, way in which the results have been communicated is clear for a third person to read and understand. You know, most times, the problems are not really with the content of the manuscript itself, but with how the content is being communicated uh, in terms of you know, the uh, figure presentation, how data are being presented, how the text is being written up to walk the reader through the findings of the manuscript. 
right? Um, and ultimately, you know, the point of the peer review is to uh, make sure that the integrity of science is not violated and that you filter out, you know, poor quality studies or invalid studies or studies that suffer from major caveats or flaws. And at the end of the process, you know, it helps authors to find the right home for their paper. If it is Journal of Physiology, then yes. Um, if we feel that it belongs to a more specialized journals, we, journal, we, we may suggest referring it to some of our sister journal publications. Uh, next slide, uh, Rishi. Yeah, so these are the various uh, steps. So Kim walked you through com the actual process of doing your experiments, writing up and manuscript submission. Once you've submitted your manuscript, it comes to the desk of the um, uh, uh, Office of the Journal of uh, Physiology, where it gets assigned to a senior editor. And the senior editor then assigns a reviewing editor such as myself. So this is based on the field and the subfield and the expertise of the senior editor and the reviewing editor. And together, the uh, senior editor and the reviewing editor decide whether this paper should be sent out for peer review. And um, it's usually, you know, it's, it's a yes, no decision. Yes, if the um, manuscript passes certain basic requirements, such as that it uh, reports a finding of potentially major significance uh, uh, and that it's um, written uh, in understandable style uh, and it doesn't uh, have suffer from poor methods or major ethical flaws. Um, and if it fails any of these tests, then uh, the manuscript is sent back to the authors. Uh, so about 30% of manuscripts are sent back to the authors um, where you know they can uh, address these uh, if it is addressable address these uh, points and if it is uh, you know potentially suitable at a different journal then they can consider that as well now when it goes when it when the uh, reviewing editor and the senior editor agree that it can go to peer review then it's the job of the reviewing editor to find suitable uh, reviewers to look at the manuscript in greater detail in fine detail and then the referees are assigned and they accept their uh, uh, assignment. And once they accept it, then um, it goes into review, which takes roughly about uh, two to three weeks, I think. And then the reports, final reports are sought. And based on the final reports, then again, the reviewing editor and the senior editor make a decision, uh, which can be one of three things, uh, either reject outright, uh, or you know, ask for revisions, which may include uh, new experiments, or accept, right? Um, and then once it's, uh, if it is rejected, then it goes back to the authors, you know, where they can look at the comments and decide how best they can address those shortcomings. If revisions are asked, typically the time slot, time frame given is about a month. In special cases, you know, longer time frames may be given. But if it's longer than, uh, you know, typically two months or so, then uh, it's rejected. But then, you know, we may consider a resubmission if the uh, reviewer comments are adequately addressed. Yeah, there we are. OK, okay. you've got the process. You want to move on? Yeah, yeah, this is good. OK, so 20%, about 20% of papers are rejected. Um, and about 20% are accepted and published. Um, and the rest um, are either, you know, uh, we ask for revisions or we reject and then ask them to resubmit later, depending on how major the revisions are. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Sally. Okay, so, um, so this is the overall structure and the process is single blind, where the author is known or the authors are known. Uh, but the reviewer identity, unless you know they want to reveal the identity, it's usually unknown, and that's because you know anonymity allows the reviewers to be honest, um, so that you know um, they can give their candid opinion about the manuscript and the work without uh, fear of prejudice. Um, and knowing the author is uh, in a way beneficial because then it allows the re reviewer to 
look at the paper in the context of the previous work coming out of that lab um, and, and assess, you know, um, where does this work stand with respect to uh, what's been known from the lab and from uh, related uh, labs elsewhere. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So what I want to stress here is that the editorial decision is not a voting process. Because if we did that, we are uh, seriously shortchanging authors. And that is because you know the reviews are very, very divergent because the reviewers are very, very divergent and come with different expertise. So somebody might have an expertise in a particular method that's being reported in the manuscript and may be able to provide a detailed view on what sorts of controls must have been done or perhaps were not done um, and can you know ask you know in light of these controls lacking then you know this result may not hold water so they need to be doing this control and so on and so forth whereas this may not be so obvious to a different reviewer who has expertise in a different aspect of the manuscript right um, and so it is the job of the reviewing editor and the senior editor to look at all of the reviewer comments in their totality and then decide uh, what should happen to the manuscript, what should we do, uh, what the ultimate decision should be. OK, uh, next question. So these are some editorial statistics. The acceptance rate for uh, papers, research papers is roughly about 23, 25%. Average uh, time to first decision. Let's look at this number. This is more important. So if we are going to triage your uh, paper or go let it go for peer review, you'll know in a very short period of time, uh, within about four days, um, this saves time. In case papers are triaged, then it saves time for you so that you know you can find a different home for your paper. Uh, we tell you within four days whether you know you're going to your paper is going to be peer reviewed or not, and the average time to first decision after uh, this process is 30 days a month, and then you get your uh, uh, first decision about whether there are going to be major revisions, minor revisions, uh, or a, or an acceptance, and so on. So these statistics are very very important, especially for early career uh, researchers, for whom Timely publication is an important uh, important uh, criterion for their career advancement. And uh, the Journal of Physiology is very, very sensitive to that. OK. And once it's accepted, uh, the articles appear uh, within a short span of time. So that is also very important. So you can send a link or put it on your uh, CV saying that you know this article is already published. Uh, there isn't a very lengthy in-press uh, time window uh, now that everything is online. OK, next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to show you some peer review st statistics. Uh, for example, you know, in, in um, for the journal, we used roughly around 1,350 different referees drawn from 42 different countries um, and um, they all, most of them received very, very high rating in terms of the quality of reviews that they produced and uh, within a very short period of time. So obviously, this is possible only because Journal of Physiology enjoys a high status among um, scientists working in this field. Um, when you say Journal of Physiology, you know, it's usually associated with high quality um, and trustworthy high end science. And that's why when we ask reviewers, they are more than willing to provide reviews and uh, provide them in a timely manner and make them uh, be of high quality. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to end by showing this particular paper, uh, which I handled for the journal. And you can see that the first author is, there is a profile for the first author. Uh, a small short biography with their picture. This is very, very nice, very encouraging for the early career researchers because typically the first authors are graduate students and postdocs. And uh, I'm sure that they appreciate having a profile of them shown like this. Um, you know, I, I, I loved seeing this when I first saw it. And it also shows the identity of the 
uh, senior editor and the reviewing editor. So we take ownership, you know, um, ownership for the fact that we vetted the process. And that is why this paper is here. So that's very important, you know, having that uh, sense of, you know, I, I stand by the decision of what I did. And here is my identity. If you have a question, you can ask me. So I will end there. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. All right. Um, so my name is Rishi. Um, I'm uh, in the molecular biophysics unit of uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great honor to be talking about um, the Journal of Physiology. Um, and I thank uh, uh, all the people who have been involved in this webinar for having me here and uh, having me talk about this. Uh, so as um, many of us, uh, as a neurophysiology student, I grew up with um, a J Physiology papers uh, of Hubel and Wiesel, um, Hodgkin and Huxley, Bernard Katz, Rodolfo Linas, uh, Bruson Lomo, LTP, um, Bert Sockman, uh, and have uh, uh, mean, gone through the rigor associated with how these uh, papers are written and how the experiments are conducted. Um, and as an instructor, uh, I have uh, uh, used these uh, uh, original papers and I've asked students to read them rather than reading books. Um, uh, please go and read the uh, original papers uh, so that you have the entire picture. A book is in some senses uh, somebody else's viewpoint of what exactly that paper says. Uh, so here on the other hand, you get to actually see what exactly the authors uh, um, said, uh, what were the caveats they added and so on and so forth. So so please go and uh, uh, read that. So, so this is one of the courses that I teach and you can go to that particular link and you will see that uh, there are so many of the papers from J Physiology that I have listed as mandatory reading. Um, and as an instructor, again, I have always asked students to submit their final project report um, as a paper in J Physiology format because uh, the section wise detailed instructions that are provided by J Physiology are uh, detailed uh, and therefore it imparts training to the students in terms of structured thinking, uh, rigorous experimental design and concrete analysis. So that's the other course that I teach. Uh, and you can see there that um, I use the J Physiology format for uh, on the final report submission, basically. Uh, as an author, uh, I'm not going to be talking too much about uh, my role as an author, uh, but over the years, I have published uh, six um, manuscripts. Five of them are uh, original research articles and one invited review with um, uh, J Physiology. And from the first paper submission until today, I have been happy with the fair, pleasant, um, insightful, and constructive review process. Um, um, and finally, I have acted as a referee for several manuscripts over the past several years uh, and continue to be happy with the review process at J Physiology from the other side as well as a referee. Right? Um, so these are some of the most common criticisms that uh, you would hear from referees uh, in terms of why your uh, um, paper has been rejected. Uh, we'll come to some of this in much more detail as we progress uh, down the lane. Uh, so the first thing is uh, um, uh, does not comply with the journal's ethics policy. There is a flaw in the design. Uh, there is a lack of proper controls. Uh, and the, um, the intervention have not been isolated. Uh, and it fails to advance the field sufficiently, inappropriate statistics, and so on and so forth. As I said, we will come to some of this uh, in more detail as we um, go down the lane. So these are some specific examples um, from um, the referees and editors. Uh, so the first one says, um, what is missing from the manuscript is a better indication of the background physiology to the study, right? So, so here the, um, the background physiology is in question. Now, the manuscript is unacceptable due to methodological problems. The data is not very convincing and it's being misinterpreted. That's the other thing. Um, the study fails to establish a specific mechanism for whatever the study is about. Um, the manuscript is pretty weak. Uh, there is an ethics issue. The, the results are fairly preliminary and are difficult to interpret. Uh, uh, the manuscript is of interest, but misses some of the relevant work undertaken with humans. Uh, so here, the model system is something that is of question. Uh, um, the study offers only an incremental advance in the field. Um, um, so the authors used ether, uh, which is grounds for rejection based on the animal ethics policy of J physiology. So as Kim had mentioned, uh, um, this is uh, uh, something very, very serious and you will have to uh, read through it. I'll show you some of that. Uh, um, the manuscript does not fall within the scope of the journal um, and there is very low power 
to detect physiologically relevant difference between groups. So this is with reference to statistical powers, actually. So these are some typical examples of why um, the referees and editors um, rejected uh, a certain paper. Uh, so we'll come back to the slide, uh, right? Uh, so which talks about uh, the common criticisms from referees. Um, so the first point says, uh, does not comply with um, the journal's ethics policy. So what is the journal's ethics policy? Um, so you have uh, a bunch of things that is available on the, the author um, um, guidelines. Uh, so these are um, um, animal ethics checklist, uh, human experiments, what exactly you will have to report. Uh, and more recently, this paper got published from the group. Uh, um, this has been published in several places, but uh, uh, J Physiology also had this uh, in their uh, um, um, journal showing uh, the guidelines uh, for uh, reporting animal research. Uh, so this is very important. Uh, make sure that uh, you comply with these uh, uh, ethics policy and uh, what exactly you will have to report uh, so that uh, your paper doesn't get rejected because uh, it does not comply with the journal's uh, ethics policy. Right. Uh, uh, the other thing is about inappropriate statistics, uh, right? So this is something which has been very, very useful. Um, um, so there is this uh, virtual issue of Journal of Physiology, uh, which talks about uh, how you report uh, uh, statistics. Uh, uh, this was in 2013. Uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, um, mean, made this mandatory reading for people in my lab and to others. Uh, uh, so that they have an idea of what exactly people look for uh, uh, and how to report uh, what statistics to do for what particular kind of uh, um, uh, experiment uh, and how to report it. Uh, all that is clearly detailed in multiple articles. Uh, so please read through this uh, and it, 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 it will help you in um, making sure that your uh, uh, paper doesn't get rejected because of uh, this particular thing, actually. Right? Uh, uh, so I did not mention about flaw in design and uh, uh, purely descriptive and fails to advance the field sufficiently because that kind of falls into do a good study, which Kim had mentioned. Uh, so if you want your paper to get into um, the Journal of Physiology or any good journal for that matter, make sure that your study is good. Um, and that is something which I can't uh, give you detailed instruction about. But these things where it is possible in terms of what exactly the journal's ethics policy is, how to report statistics, uh, and how to write your paper, and what exactly is the scope of the journal. Uh, that is something which is clearly written uh, in, in, in the Journal of Physiology websites. Um, so this is uh, information for authors. Uh, and here you will get detailed descriptions uh, of what exactly goes into each and every section, what goes into the abstract. Uh, what goes into the introduction, what does not go into the discussion. Uh, so all that gets uh, um, very clearly written out. Uh, and therefore, there is no scope for interpretation. If you follow it, uh, uh, you will have uh, a good paper written with um, a very detailed uh, organization that is present over there. Apart from this, uh, the information for authors also gives you um, how to report the different aspects of the study and the underlying experiments. Uh, for example, when they talk about computational papers, um, um, they say that uh, it is very important to perform a sensitivity analysis. Uh, so what is sensitivity analysis? Uh, let's say you have put together a model for um, a certain physiological phenomena, right? And now you are showing um, that that particular model works for that particular physiological phenomena without uh, any changes in the parameter. So at that point of time, you should not be, I mean, that, that doesn't uh, um, um, say that the model that you are presenting uh, is not a house of cards. What do I mean by that? You put up one little parameter by a small amount, uh, then the whole schema falls apart. Uh, that shouldn't be the case, actually, because physiological systems are robust. Uh, and therefore, you should ask uh, how sensitive is your model to perturbations to the different model parameters that are present in your model. Uh, and report that in a systematic fashion, right? So, so Journal of Physiology tells that clearly that you will have to do this uh, 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 when you present uh, present uh, uh, computational papers. So, and this is about scope and subject areas. Uh, so this will tell you what exactly is the scope of the journal so that uh, you don't submit material that is outside the scope of the journal, right? Um, so as a referee, what do I look for in manuscripts? So this is my um, uh, personal uh, 
uh, scheme of things, personal viewpoints about what I look for in manuscripts. Uh, so the first question I ask is the um, and the question well formulated. Um, does the experimental design that the authors have formulated, does it allow the authors to rigorously address that specific question? Um, it could be posed as a hypothesis. Uh, in that case, I would ask whether um, the experimental design would allow the authors to uh, rigorously test the hypothesis one way or the other. Uh, right? uh, in manuscripts uh, defining animal experiments, um, I would make sure that uh, um, all the ethical guidelines are adhered to. Um, and for experimental manuscripts, again, uh, are there appropriate controls for each and every experiment, eliminating potential alternate interpretations of the data? Right. So sometimes what what the authors do is that they have this uh, linear narrative. Uh, they just uh, have one way of interpreting the data that they have, uh, and they end up saying that okay, this is the data that I have, uh, and this is the only possible interpretation that comes out of it. Um, but I mean. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, several physiological systems are, are uh, heavily interdependent uh, multi-parametric system and therefore there are always uh, other potential alternate interpretations to it. Uh, so therefore you will have to have appropriate controls uh, to ensure that that alternate interpretation is not why you are observing what you are observing. Uh, so that is something that I ask for each and every experiment that is present over there. Uh, in computational uh, uh, manuscript, the first thing that I ask is whether the model is physiologically relevant. Um, right? so, so you can put together several computational models uh, um, for any specific phenomena, but that does not necessarily mean that uh, it would be translatable to uh, what is there in the physiological system. So therefore, the model has to be directly relatable uh, to the physiological system. Otherwise, the outcomes that come out of the model become impossible to interpret uh, from the physiological perspective, actually. So I ask if uh, the model is physiologically relevant uh, and is there enough sensitivity analysis presented uh, to show that the model employed isn't a house of cards? This is what I explained. Uh, do the conclusions follow from the data or are the authors uh, selectively interpreting the data that they have? Uh, so, so. Uh, um, so sometimes the the abstract might read uh, um, in a certain fashion. Now you go and read through the the results, uh, the data that comes out of that particular section, or that uh, the data that is being presented uh, doesn't necessarily support the the abstract that is presented. Uh, so I always look for such disparity in um, the abstract uh, or the title versus uh, what is presented in the actual uh, uh, results. Uh, and I mean, I also encourage all the younger researchers to also read through the method section more carefully because that is where the details are. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, you understand the method section and you make sure that it, it, it's being done rigorously. So many a times the, the early career researchers, uh, they just read the abstract and take only the conclusions or the results uh, and run with it basically, right? So, so you will have to ask yourself if, uh, if the conclusions that are drawn from the experiments that are presented uh, are actually uh, something that come out of the data or are the authors uh, interpreting uh, it uh, in a certain fashion basically. So whenever you get a, uh, whenever you read a paper, um, don't just read it, uh, assume that you are a reviewer uh, and you are reviewing it um, for that particular journal, for our, another journal, it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, make sure that uh, each of these things, uh, does the data um, support the conclusion? Are there appropriate controls? Uh, is there enough sensitivity analysis? Uh, ask each of these questions. Uh, don't just take the title as the takeaway home, uh, take home message from the paper. Instead, analyze each and every step, basically. Right? Uh, you want to make sure that the statistical text tests are correctly designed and implemented. Uh, and another thing that I find uh, uh, among uh, uh, certain authors is that they will be happy that the p-value associated with the statistical test is uh, some point zero 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 one. But if you look at the actual uh, physiological change in the um, in the amount of change that is observed in that parameter, uh, that might be like one percentage or point five percentage, and it might not make uh, any physiological sense uh, in terms of what exactly it would do to that. Uh, uh, system basically like say for instance if you have uh, action potential height uh, let's say and let's say it varies from uh, 100 millivolts uh, 
to 99.5 millivolts uh, the means uh, and it is the p value is uh, less than 0 0.001 uh, but that difference of 100 to 99.5 doesn't make much of a difference um, uh, in terms of action potential height basically right so so you should not just look at it from the perspective of what the statistical test is telling you but you should also ask what is this difference going to do to the system from a physiological standpoint um, so that is another thing that i look for uh, and does the discussion place the study in the context of the literature uh, um, i mean are the is the literature adequately represented over there uh, and are the limitations and the assumptions uh, acknowledged and accounted for uh, it's very important to have uh, a limitation section um, and tell that these are the limitations of the study these are the assumptions and this is how it is rectified uh, um, so those are important things that need to be present in the discussion in general uh, so that you know um, uh, you acknowledge that uh, I understand these are the limitations uh, to the um, reader that is reading it basically right uh, and I also ask if in the context of the literature does the study advance the field um, sufficiently enough uh, and finally I ask if um, start go back to the question that was originally formulated uh, and ask if the study actually answers the question that the authors uh, posed at the beginning uh, or if they test the hypothesis one way or the other right so those are some of the things that I look for um, in manuscripts when I act as a referee, basically. Right. And then once the review process is complete uh, and you get the reviews back uh, and you will have to respond to the referees, basically. Right. So, so in this case, uh, it's, 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 it's important to realize that uh, the referees are trying to help you in uh, making sure that your your paper is as good as uh, it can get basically right so so in this case uh, i mean um, complete uh, the additional experiments that are um, required uh, if they are needed uh, and look for clues from the editor so the editor is the final arbiter uh, um, there might be reviewer one saying something reviewer two might be saying something else uh, and the reviewer th three might be saying something else altogether uh, but there will be an editorial summary of what exactly is being expected in this revision uh, so look for that uh, and make sure that you use that as the guideline for conducting the experiments that you uh, have to conduct to address those questions uh, rigorously basically right uh, try to understand what the referees are really saying uh, and uh, uh, make sure that uh, you are uh, um, in line with that thinking if you have any questions you could write to the editor and ask them uh, uh, and uh, see if uh, they have an opinion one way or the other about that particular thing. Uh, if the referees did not understand your work, so many of the times we tell that, oh, rev reviewer two did not understand what I was talking about. Uh, so one thing to ask yourself is, uh, is that because uh, you did not present it clearly in the first place? So your language has to be clear. It has to be um, in a manner that is uh, uh, conveying what you wanted to convey in your head. Uh, you might be conveying what you wanted to convey, but it is not being conveyed to others, basically, because you might understand your lab's language. Uh, you would have a certain way of thinking within your laboratory, and therefore, you might think of certain words uh, to have certain meanings. Uh, but when it goes to the general audience, uh, that might not necessarily be the case. Uh, so that's why it's important to have several people read your manuscript before you send it out for review so that they will have their own suggestions and you can modify it appropriately actually right. uh, it's very important that you address all the comments uh, in a point by point fashion uh, uh, don't just pick and choose and say that okay i will just pick these and uh, address only these uh, and hope and pray that it works uh, uh, it's important that you address it one way or the other uh, uh, all the comments should be addressed uh, in a point by point uh, uh, fashion uh, and because it's your work uh, and you have toiled for it uh, toiled on it uh, for a period of years together uh, and therefore it, it it it's it's normal to feel uh, very personally associated with it uh, but when you see comments which are uh, um, discouraging uh, uh, resist the temptation to prepare uh, a very impassioned response to the points uh, that you disagree so the general uh, advice that people give is uh, if you want to write an impassioned response, write it, uh, print it, read it, and tear it apart, throw it into the dustbin, and start over again. Right. So, so it's very important to acknowledge that uh, the editors and the reviewers are there for 
uh, making your paper better uh, and therefore you ask yourself how can I take this comment uh, and make it uh, um, mean useful in terms of either increasing the readability of my study or the increasing the rigor of my study um, and you take that step rather than saying that okay the reviewer is wrong and I'm going to write this impassioned response uh, that doesn't necessarily help action right uh, so uh, if you truly believe that this is the right thing to do and the reviewer is wrong uh, state it uh, but politely um, state it diplomatically and politely and say that this is the reason why I believe that this is the case uh, and for every statement that you make uh, preferably provide citations uh, so that they know that the literature is something that backs you up in that kind of a scenario right so so and it's a good idea to even uh, um, ask a neutral colleague uh, to review a response uh, so that it doesn't come about uh, too diplomatic or too uh, I mean feeble or too strong uh, so I mean uh, it, it, it's the middle path that you want to take uh, you don't want to um, give away all your uh, uh, I mean ground and say that okay whatever you say is right uh, and whatever I am saying is wrong uh, or you don't want to say it the other way around uh, you want to take the middle ground and make sure that you use the review in as uh, effective a fashion that it would help you take your uh, paper uh, uh, to better readers uh, to larger group of readers basically right? so so in, in in most of the cases uh, the editors and reviewers are not uh, paid for what they do right uh, so they are here for helping your uh, helping you to improve your work your presentation and so on and so forth uh, and they invest a lot of time uh, in terms of reading your paper uh, uh, looking at the literature and saying that okay this can be improved that can be improved so so every time you you write a, a replies letter uh, a rebuttal letter uh, um, please thank the editor and the reviewers for their time and effort uh, and uh, um, that that I mean it's it's just courtesy I guess uh, um. So I mean, um, there are several advantages of uh, publishing in the in the Journal of Physiology. So um, as I said, uh, several of us uh, have grown with the uh, J Physiology papers and uh, the rigor associated with the, with the science that is presented over there uh, and with the style that it is presented over the years. Uh, um, um, so it, 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 it has that recognition. Um, so it's a leading uh, general research uh, journal in that particular, in this discipline, which is physiology. The scope is broad, as Latsala mentioned. Um, the, um, the readership is uh, international, uh, and there are um, 5 million um, full text downloads per year. Uh, and as Latsala mentioned, um, there are more than 50,000 citations per year, uh, and it is uh, really old journal uh, and uh, I mean people when they hear the word uh, hear the phrase the journal of physiology they associate it with the quality they associate it with the reliability um, so um, there are several Nobel laureates who have published in the journal lab uh, and it expects the highest standards for uh, animal and human study the ethics guidelines uh, promotes rigor and reproducibility via statistical reporting mandates uh, uh, read through the author guidelines uh, and uh, that set of articles that I showed you um, they are very good uh, for even a starting uh, researcher uh, as to how to report these basically okay, so, so there are several uh, um, advantage additional no submission fees so there is no um, restriction on article length so you don't have to artificially uh, cut down citations you don't have to artificially cut down a lengthy discussion bringing into context uh, the several different aspects of your study um, so it supports prior publication on preprint servers uh, so you can actually put it on bio archive and then submit it to the J physiology um, constructive peer review comments um, the time to first decision is uh, um, around a month uh, and you can submit pre submission enquiries as well if you have questions about whether this is something that uh, J Physiology would consider. Um, you could ask them um, by address by asking here, basically. Right? So, so there are other important advantages as well. So, so make use of these advantages of uh, um, the J Physiology and see if your paper would uh, find a home here. Basically. So that's all I have for the day. I will uh, hand it over to Sally. Uh, I hope. Uh, I was audible throughout the um, presentation, um, and I will stop, stop here.
Thank you, Rishi. Yes, um, everything went smoothly, I think. Um, sorry about the technical glitches. Um, just to let you know, uh, Kim has to leave in a couple of minutes. Um, so thank you very much, Kim, for your presentation. Um, if there are any questions specifically for Kim, I can follow up with Kim afterwards, but um, thank you very much. Um, so there's been a couple of questions. Um, one question was about the moving sort of trend towards um, how was moving away from the traditional peer review process of submit to a journal, have it reviewed, and then publish. And um, we're looking um, at some some journals or publication um, outlets. Um, you publish your work, um, then it gets reviewed, and then perhaps a journal will um, act as the curator. So that is sort of shifting um the publication to um ha happening before um anyone has commented and um, peer reviewers have commented on your work and that is a move that some people are taking we haven't um moved um to that format but uh, just an update which i hope will be of uh, interest to um you especially early career researchers is that we'll be moving towards publishing our peer review comments alongside accepted papers so when you see a manuscript which has been accepted and it's but Sarah says you can see who edited it well as um supporting information on those online publications you'll also be able to see the peer review history so you'll be able to see the original and subsequent decision letters what the referees comments were and how the authors responded so as Rishi said you know sometimes you might need to stand firm and say, actually, the referee might have got it wrong, and this is why we don't believe we need to make these revisions. Or they may say, yes, thank you very much for those suggestions. We have now gone back to the lab, collected more information, and this is now an acceptable format. So by publishing those reports, you'll be able to see the journey of the manuscript, although it's in the traditional submit, review, then publish format, we're hoping that this will aid transparency and enable researchers to see the journey that each um, paper has gone through in its um, publication process. So hopefully that is some way to promote openness, transparency, although it still uses the traditional method of publishing in a journal. So hopefully that um, uh, answers that question. Um, it'll be interesting to see what other journals do and, and more traditional journals do in the way to um, approach um, openness and transparency. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, as an author, you may prefer one version, yeah, putting your research up on a preprint server as the first step and then get, getting comments. It's really up to the author, but as a journal, that's the way we've decided to go. Um, we do, um, do I, don't, I can't remember if it was specifically mentioned, but we do allow pre prior publication on preprint servers. So if you did want to put your work up on a preprint server, perhaps get some um, community feedback and then submit, that's, that, that, that's, that's fine too. So we just want to publish the best research possible in the end. Um, we're pretty accommodating as to what authors would like to do with their research prior to coming to us. Another question, which um, I'm not sure of which point in the presentation this came in but it was a question about the importance of the impact factor and i think all three presenters mentioned um sort of the various metrics that we um display on our journal we don't have the highest impact factor um we never will broad physiology journals are never going to be sort of getting impact factors of 30 or anything like that it's the nature of the field so really what you should be doing you can look at the impact factor by all means as an as a simple metric to um perhaps give an idea of uh, the quality of some of the papers within it but really you should be looking at those other metrics to determine the quality of the journal um it's all very well being a high high impact um, journal but what if no one will ever find your research what if no one will ever see it to download it so really the first step to getting a citation is to be visible and looking at those other things that journals do, like social media promotion. Um, we've got over 28,000 followers on Twitter. You know, we tweet pretty much every paper we publish. So, you know, as an author, you're going to be seen. And then, of course, the next step is the citations. Also, a lot of journals with high impact factors are actually very low volume. So they might only publish uh, you know, 50 or so papers a year, whereas the journal of physiology does 500, you know, so all these things affect the calculation of the impact factor, which is should not be used to assess quality. It's we know that certain um, funders, certain expectations, certain countries think, right, oh, you need to publish an impact factor over X. Well, that's all very well, but we're trying 
to educate the community, not single-handedly, there's a big group of people who say, you know, do not use the impact factor as the sole metric. You know, you should not be judging an article based on a complete journal's impact factor. So really look at look at those more in-depth article metrics um, to help pick your journal. Um, the journal of physiology is not going to um, really ever <laughs> increase its impact factor by legitimate means. Um, Otherwise, so it's, it's, it's always around about the high 4.8, between 4.8 and 5 over the past few years. It's never going to suddenly jump up to 15. But if you look at the citations that um, the citation metrics that Vatsara pointed out, it, it's does very well in all the other metrics. So I think it's just caution. Use it with care. Um, it, it helps to inform your overall opinion of a journal, um, but it shouldn't be used as the sole metric. Um, I think that Sorry, would be- can I, can I add to that? So I think the question comes from the point of view of um, early career researchers mm -hmm. wanting to enhance their CVs because impact factor is somehow seen as, you know, if you publish in a high enough impact factor, then you're supposed to be at the uh, top of your field. Mm -hmm. But, you know, evaluators are i want to tell the people in the audience that evaluators are increasingly moving away from this the impact factor is only used in places where you know the evaluation uh, body does not have expertise in the particular subfield that the applicant uh, is uh, working in uh, and it shouldn't be used it it is as kim mentioned the impact factor is something that a librarian should use to evaluate whether they should subscribe to this journal or not. Is it is it should I spend my subscription um, uh, funds that I have on this journal or is it worth uh, subscribing to it or not? It's not for individual authors, uh, but somehow you know we've we've subverted that uh, into an evaluation of researchers themselves. But having gotten ourselves in this knot. I think uh, in this age of uh, connectedness and visibility of your paper on multiple databases, um, you should worry about having it in a place that's appropriate for the particular topic of your research and not so much be driven by the impact factor. Because ultimately, you know, the evaluation is based on how the field perceives your work which it can only evaluate and perceive if it's visible, like Sally mentioned. Yeah, um, it's, it's a shame that the impact factor is still used by certain committees or assessment panels. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, yeah, we're hoping that everyone will move away from that. And as Rishi pointed out, the quality and the rigor of the review process is something which is, you know, we've been doing for many, many the rigor of the of the journal which hopefully when you see the journal of physiology on your cv if someone knows the field and knows what you do well then they'll know that that's a a, a very hard journal to publish in a yeah Yes, she is. She's back. I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, did, 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 um, I don't know if either of you answered the question about the traditional medicinal systems in modern physiology. Um, any comments on that? Not yet, I think. Uh, okay. So what I want to say to that is that if the study is done in a rigorous fashion, I don't see why not. I don't know what Rishi wants to say. Mm, I think you and Sally covered the uh, what needs to be said <laughs> I mean, people if you can't measure what you should be measuring uh, you end up measuring what you can measure uh, so if you can't measure the quality of science uh, then you end up measuring impact factors so, so if you can measure what you should be measuring uh, then uh, quantities like impact factors should not matter mm -hmm. right yeah uh, so I was referring to the next question, which is, do you accept physiological aspects in traditional medic medic medicinal systems in relation with modern physiology? And so I said, um, if it is done in a rigorous fashion and, uh, you know, uh, 
it uh, ticks all the major uh, points that rishi you mentioned in terms of and kim mentioned in terms of designing a good study i don't see why not yes i think the, the I mean, key is uh, the i don't know the the policies the of j physiology with reference to that uh, so I mean, you know that better so i just thought i wouldn't comment on that now Okay, thank you. Well, there's been no more questions, so and we are over time. Apologies uh, for that. Right. Well, I think um, we better wrap up now. So, thank you both uh, to Vatsala and Rishi. Um, apologies for the technical issues. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with it. Um, it's been a, a year now, I think, since we've all been doing everything online. So, um, thank you very much for attending. And the the session has been um, recorded, and we will be putting it on um, our YouTube channel. So. Um, if you need to find it, um, it will be available. You can recap. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And um, I think we'll end it there. And thanks uh, once again for joining. I hope it was interesting and useful for your future careers. The J Physiol inbox, you can email that as much as you like. It's um, jphysiol at physoc.org. And um, any questions are more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, okay, you, thank you for you. the participation. Thank you, Sally, for uh, helping put thank this you. together. And thank you, Patricia. And uh, thank you, Rishi, for joining in. And thanks, Kim, who's logged off. But yes, yeah, she's just had to go to another meeting. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>